Hello, Andrew. Nice to have you today. Nice, nice to talk to you today. <laughs> Indeed, and great to have you on the call. Perhaps I'll introduce myself to, to, to the listeners and, and viewers. Um, I'm Andrew Knight from RICS. I've been with RICS for nearly nearly 11, uh, nearly 12 years now, actually, losing count. And uh, I sit within the standards, regulatory and thought leadership part of the organisation. And my role is to look at the whole impact of data and technology right across the built and natural environment. And with over 110,000 members qualified working across the globe, uh, working right across the whole property and land life cycle, all the way through land and acquisition, development, construction, valuation, brokerage, finance of real estate, operations, property management, management, and indeed end of life. Obviously, data and technology has a huge impact and a huge positive impact on the way our profession works. And indeed, our profession also works right across those different asset types, land itself, residential, commercial in all its forms, alternative assets and infrastructure. So clearly, a very wide ranging area in which data and tech is having a huge positive impact on the profession. And obviously, it's great to talk to you, uh, Elia and, and Ross today. So it'd be great to perhaps hear a bit from both of you in terms of your backgrounds and the kind of origin story of Cosmos. Sure. Yes, I've invited uh, Ross Griffin here. Ross? Will I give a bit of introduction? So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Ross Griffin, Andrew, and um, I'm originally from Ireland, but I've spent the last uh, decade on and off uh, here in, in, in Denmark. Um, by profession, I'm a quantity severe cost manager. I have 10 plus years experience on the client side, 10 plus years experience on, on the contractor side, both in pre-construction and the execution phase. So quite kind of a broad um, knowledge base on on uh, on the construction industry, but especially the commercial aspect of it. Um, I won't go into Cosmos. I think, Elia, you should uh, introduce that uh, in yourself. So I'll let you ask. Yes, uh, and I'm Elia González. I'm a Spanish, but have been working in Denmark for the last number of years. I started working in the public sector in Spain and when I moved to Denmark, I shifted my career into the cost uh, management uh, portion of, uh, of the construction and uh, had to adjust uh, what I had learned uh, by education and profession to the digital uh, uh, advant uh, advanced uh, stage yeah. of the yeah. industry here. Uh, that's when uh, I actually discovered my interest around data. Uh, mm. The reason being I was struggling with managing that data, so I actually started understanding a little better uh, data structures mm. and all the digital aspects of how to improve and automate our processes. And I think that's where I am now. I can, mm. I, I'm not sure if you can define that as a career or a profession more than inventing it and mm. naming it digital quantity surveying, which I think I think it is what it, <laughs> what it is mm. uh, at the moment. And we both uh, founded the Cosmos a few years ago. Uh, it's a Danish and Irish company at the moment, and we have a focus precisely on on uh, on trying to to bring this uh, professionalism to the industry, the digital management of projects from a cost perspective. Well, that's great to hear. And I'm always very, very cheered when, when I talk to our tech partners and, uh, and see that not only have they built technical expertise, but they've got that deep understanding of the practice area that they've been working in as well. Because, you know, technology is not there as a, a, an end in itself. Hmm. It's there to support the profession, exactly. make it more productive, deliver better services to clients. So it's great to hear that. Now, I, I think, we're, you know, we're obviously here to kind of talk about how surveyors work in a digital uh, environment and particularly obviously quantity surveyors, cost engineers, depending on the kind of jurisdiction you're working in and in, in, in how they're described. And I think it'd be great to get your views, both of you, on how you see quantity surveyors working in this increasingly digital world. I mean, I'm old enough to remember two-dimensional drawings, you know, CAD, AutoCAD, you know, back in the 80s when people began to start actually having that kind of digital ability to draft. But obviously things have moved on hugely. And how do you see that relationship between the digital world and the world of quantity surveying? Yeah, that, uh, now you mentioned drawings. Uh, we, we like to refer to that as work on a screen, but not necessarily on a digitalized uh, uh, aspect, right? One thing is just to work with with the technology, and another thing is to embrace it and actually feed it, if that I makes sense. <laughs> I'd like to, <laughs> yeah. you were mentioning AutoCAD in 2D, and I was going to say, Andrew, can you explain that to us, please? Because I don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> but, uh, but no, uh, uh, the joke, of course. Um, <laughs> from a QS perspective, we have this 
value seeing, I guess, within Cosmos and it's, it's value driven cost management. And ideally speaking, from a quantity severe cost management's perspective, we are the user of and collector of information and data from the other stakeholders within a project lifecycle delivery. And we always have been. Nothing has changed here. We have always taken the information from the architects and the engineers and developed and collected that information and structured it in a, in a commercial sense in order to be able to procure a project and manage the contract during the execution. So nothing has changed in terms of that process. What has changed is how information today is developed and delivered to us as the digital cost manager, digital quantity surveyor. And this is what we think is the absolute future for, for our profession. Another change is how much uh, we have uh, or, or the opportunity that we have at the moment to actually automate much more of that process so that the information that comes to us, it comes in a format that can be used either straight away or in a much faster way so we can exactly. invest the time rather than those uh, tedious and, and manual and time consuming tasks, but actually into really understanding and providing value uh, to the project. And I would say if we if we reflect back to the days of AutoCAD and 2D, Andrew, um, the quantity surveying is process of uh, creating a cost estimate or cost plan or a bill of quantities was very much about uh, taking the information once it is prepared and delivered by the design team and interp interpreting the information so that you as a quantity sphere could create your documentation and deliver your value. But today that is absolutely not the case anymore. We cannot sit and receive information without, first of all, being involved in the creation of that information. And what I mean by that is, is the architects and engineers are, are valued um, uh, professionals, create the geometries uh, within a, a, a digital uh, environment. And we as cost managers now take that information we don't measure the geometries anymore. It's a byproduct of what the architect and engineers do. So effectively, the architect and, architects and engineers are quantifying for us. Uh, we had we talked a few months back about the, the debt of quantity surveying, not as a profession, I need to add, but as a as a task. We don't quantify anymore, do we? In, in, a, in a general sense, we will always need to do some type of manual quantification, I would say. But in a general sense, the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of, of, of the information in 20% of, of, of the, um, the elements gives us what we need quickly. So again, we're, we're now changing how we in, engage and interact with, with our fellow stakeholders. And that is something that... I think as quantity surveyors, we really need to mm. get out into the market and understand. And and it is in a way expected, isn't it? Like in today's uh, lifestyle, we are used to immediate everything. Like we have uh, immediate phone calls rather than what it used to be. We have washing machines, we have uh, fast speed uh, trains, fast speed internet. We are, we are claiming and we are expecting immediate everything. Uh, and this, I think, is also uh, how the clients are changing their requirements on projects. They expect it to be immediate and definitely proactive rather than, than passive or reactive. So if you tell the clients that they have already like a full design project and tell them, well, you are over budget, then we now understand that that's actually uh, wrong, like n not ideal advice. Uh, the ideal advice is to actually warn them, predict that. And the only way to do that is actually be, be proactive. You cannot do that with the old school or old times traditional conventional processes because you will be relaying on other uh, or the, on deliveries from the project. You really need to be involved in the process. Mm. Uh, together with the other, with the producers of the information, them being design teams or uh, procurement teams or any any other stakeholder involved in the project producing information, 
to, to actually catch and, and be able to, to analyze that information and, and advise proactively to the client from a commercial cost perspective. Exactly. So, I mean, what, what, what you're describing is almost, and it's perhaps an overused and sometimes misunderstood term, is this sense of real time, that actually everything is happening in that real time yeah, sense indeed, that there's indeed. no disconnection. That's and I guess it'd be interesting for, for you to help perhaps our listeners understand perhaps what is commonly used, but these terms of 3D, 4D, 5D, BIM, and indeed also the common data environment, because it, it, it's that, I think, as you said, Ross, that that multiple stakeholders sharing information in a way that, that's connected, that means that these decisions don't come uh, as a surprise, or these, 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 these reports don't come as a surprise. Could, so perhaps could, if you could define for us where you see BIM at the moment in terms of that evolution to, to, to 3, 4, 5D and beyond, and also how common data environments are, 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 are a part of that story in terms of the process and that the ability to share data. Yes. So being, being, uh, being the, um, the process, building information management, has been sectorized into different dimensions. Now, these dimensions are referring to the specific or specialized information that is produced in each of them. So 3D will be the volumes, the geometries. 4D will be the time information produced for the project. 5D will be the cost. 6D, sustainability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, these dimensions fit into the BIM uh, uh, strategies and they will fit their information into their common data environment. So we need to understand that now all these dimensions are interconnected, meaning the information produced on all these specialized professions is interconnected. Um, we often see that the dimensions, because they are numerical, they are represented or understood as a sequence where you cannot do 4D unless you have 3D, and you cannot do 3D unless you have 2D, and you cannot do cost 5D unless you have 4D or 3D. Now, this is a misconception that actually, uh, if you reflect back and think, when does my project have cost information? Well, very, very, very early, as soon as there is a budget set up. That is information on the project that, is con that constitutes 5D, and that is already been information that should be uh, aligned or, or uh, connected in the data uh, in the common data environment as it will need to be um, produced in a way that will be uh, interconnected. At that stage, you should have a BIM execution plan or some guidelines and some requirements as per how all this information is to be produced. Mm -hmm. So I think that we are at different stages on development on the different dimensions um, for, for, for many, many, many reasons. Mm -hmm. But understanding that all these dimensions are parallel and that whenever there is a change in any of them, there is a change on the details in the 2D, in the schedule of equipment in the 2D, there is a change in the geometry in the 3D or a change in time because your procurement strategy mm. has been changed, therefore there is an impact in time, there is as well an impact in cost. Mm. So I think that we should not wait till uh, all these other disciplines or these other specialized professions have mastered and developed their uh, full strategies and uh, procedures and, uh, mm. and uh, design information. To, 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 for, for the cost managers to actually be involved uh, in the digital uh, or, or common data environment. I would say that the dimensions are mutually inclusive. They one affects the other. Um, and I think the, the original principles around building information modeling or building information management was supplementing the 3D geometry with time, with cost, and embedding it within one kind of federated model. But the reality of how we work as stakeholders and disciplines doesn't really allow for that. Um, embedding cost within the 3D model environment doesn't give you any additional values because, as we mentioned earlier on, cost structures are very important to the quantity surveying profession cost structures so that we can benchmark and code uh, our benchmark and estimate in early stages and collect data in that structured way. Embedding into the model and working within a, a singular platform to drive all dimensions, it just isn't possible in our opinion. 
And also because, well, if you are limiting your cost information to whatever is available on the 3D geometries, you will be leaving aside so much, so, so many other costs. So, for example, when we are, as I said, we as cost managers, we will be looking at information in all dimensions. So we are also looking at procurement strategies. We will be looking at time. We will be looking at 2D details, descriptions, and 3D. Now, if we are to estimate, we will take into account all these pieces of information from the common data environment to create our cost estimate or mm. our you know, uh, delivery for the project. If we are to limit our cost information only to what is available in only one dimension, then that will be only a portion of the project. <laughs> exactly. And we did some analysis on this, actually, Andrew, when we looked at um, a project and the level of information received from the 3D model and the value of that information. Um, monetary value. Monetary yeah. value, yeah, excuse me, when, when analysed in the bill of quantities. Actually, when looking at the building itself as a, an isolated, direct deliverable, it was only, we model only about 70% of the value or maybe very good projects will model about 80 percent of the value but that's the direct building costs if we looked at the entire project as a capex delivery we only model in terms of 3d around 40 percent of the entire value so uh, we're driving this type of narrative saying that you know BIM is, is, is 3D, it's not, it's information. And actually what we get from a, a 3D environment is actually only a fraction of what the entire project value is for a potential client or investor. So 5D information suddenly becomes, in our opinion, extremely valuable if structured, if collected, and if analyzed. And that is, of course, without looking at the entire life cycle, yeah, absolutely. Of the project, that's, only right? that's, that's only CAPEX. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could get into a whole other remit of, of discussion here in operational and life cycle and end of life and so on and so forth. Maybe that's one for another day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I suppose that, that that point does reinforce the fact that it, this is more about a broader common data environment than everything relying on a, a geometric model of, of the asset that, as you, self, as you said, only actually captures a percentage of the costs and is only part of that common data environment. I, I think you joked earlier, uh, Ross, about the sort of the, the, the death of the profession in, in a non-serious way. But I, I suppose it is worth perhaps on a closing discussion point, thinking about how does software fit in overall within the, the, this role, this area of practice? Because clearly, Technology is not an end in itself, it's a tool. And in so many areas where technology is deployed, the power of it is to, is to augment and support human beings, not replace them. So how do you see that kind of relationship uh, evolving and developing between quantity surveyors, cost engineers, and the technology that they now have that they can use? The, the role and the profession is evolving. Um, what we did 10 years ago in terms of quantity surveying as a traditional practice is now changing. We cannot do and deliver the same professional, um, I, I, I guess the same prof professional consultancy to our clients that we did 10 years ago in the same way because now everything has shifted. It's more about information management and standardization and analytics from our perspective in terms of cost management and quantity surveying. And it's about information, getting the best out of the information that you develop within a project. Um, and it takes a little bit of a, a kind of a step back from the profession and a, a umbrella or helicopter view of it and look at really, are we really working smart? Are we really working smart as quantity surveyors today? I'll give you an, a little example. Do we really need quantity surveyors sitting on the construction site um, managing, you know, monthly payments? Can we automate that? Is there a technology that will allow us to automate that? And if so, how do we assure that that happens on our projects? Because one of the challenges, Andrew, today for our our uh, specialization or discipline is that we just do not we do not have enough quantity surveyors for the global market because we mm. don't they're not produced in every country. So we need to become more smart as, as companies, as institutions like the RICS, 
um, as universities and really consider what is the quantity surveyor in the future. And of course, technology comes into that. And challenge efficiency, right? Challenge efficiency and try to put a solution to the lack of efficiency of in our processes, actually by being supported by tools. This tool has mm. been softwares and technologies that are available. Now, exactly. the technology and the software is not going to do the job for us. Uh, the, we still need to be uh, uh, experts or special, specialists and professionals on what we do, but also uh, be open-minded to actually try to optimize that by using uh, software technology of, of any kind yeah. as a tool. It's an enabler for us to get the best out of our knowledge and experience. And cost management or quantity surveying in, in terms of that specialization of commercial and contractual and risk overview, that's not going anywhere. It might become more automated, meaning that we might not need as many resources on projects because we will automate a lot of it. It, might, it will also mean by using technology and data, we will become an awful lot more accurate in how we uh, develop our business cases, our risk profiles and our strategies for delivering projects because we will be using historical data to uh, benchmark against, but also perhaps we begin to use AI and machine learning to predict mm. what our projects will be in the future for us. And uh, and for companies that are actually realizing of these and taking action and uh, and defining their digital strategies in the company because they really want to provide a digital service, uh, I would also say that it's not about um, defining which software your team is going to use. It's about much more than that. It's about understanding this process, understanding the requirements and what will be the delivery and then train or, or try to change the mindset of your entire team because it's not just providing them with the tool. It's not just providing them with the license for the software to use. Mm -hmm. It is about much more that the, needs to take place and that's not a, a quick thing. It's not just installing the software and then really we go, we are all digital. It, it takes time and, uh, and it needs to be embraced. Indeed, you, you say as, as much digitalization is about human beings as it is technology, isn't it, in terms of changes of behavior and the way people work. Yes. It so. is how to use uh, correctly something, right? Uh, you, you may get a, a wheel and actually use it as a, as a paper, paper holder. Right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's about how to, how to use it on the, on the best way and proper way. Well, it's been fascinating to talk today. Uh, Elia and Ross, thanks so much for your input uh, and an incredibly interesting discussion today. And I look forward to speaking again in the future. Yeah. Excellent. Cheers, Andrew. Th Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.